Also, if, if you see, this is not public, I cannot show you, but if you see the, the watching patterns of people looking at images, it's not the same of text. So usually in text, people look from the top to the bottom and then from left to right. But in image search, people want this more around. They, they look at the right thing and then they look around. So the typical uh, text search assumption will be that if a person clicks in this image, it's because that person didn't really like this image, right? So didn't click in the first result, click in the second result, let's assume that the first was not relevant. Same here. The person click here, so let's assume that these three are not relevant because the person is going, say, left to right, top to bottom. But what you see is different. It's more something like this. If people click in this image, it's because most of the time, all the others around were not relevant. So this was the best of this block. And that's why we have to use these uh, clicks in blocks, because they imply what people is looking. So people look at one thing, and then they can look around. So I will skip the, the implementation, but basically we use a multi-layer perception as a machine learning uh, tool. But basically you have to reconstruct these blocks from the query log. And here we use uh, pictures from Flickr. So in the evaluation, it's 3.5 million pictures from Flickr, only public images. And we had the metadata. And we got 600K unique queries from the search log. And we have also the clicks and the views. So basically, you know what the person clicked and what the person didn't click. And we filter out all the non flicker results and all the non-public images. And we kept only the queries that were for flicker results and public. So this, this can be redone with another image search engine. So basically, you get something like this. You have the image. You have the tags. You have all the other metadata, and so on. Now you have to learn from clicks. So first, clicks at rank one were ignored. So you know there's um, one problem with clicks, and you have to be very careful if the clicks are biased by the user interface and by the ranking. So people will click more in the first image only because it's there, it's in the first place. And second, people will click more in the first page of results than the second because you need more effort to go to the second page of results. So really, we have to unbias clicks. And there are some procedures. There are two or three papers on how to unbias clicks to account for this bias of the user interface and also of the ranking. The main one is the ranking, especially if you're looking at only the top 10 results or top 20 results. So again, we will do this idea of train and evaluate in blocks. So basically, it seems that you have one plus and one minus. So this will be the standard way to train in text search. So three was relevant, and the previous one was not relevant. So this is one block. Or the, the other block could be, OK, five was relevant, but four and two were not relevant because they were not, not click. So this will be the equivalent of the blocks for web search. However, as I said, the blocks for image search are more complicated, but I'm not putting them here just to, um, to, to make clear the concept. So basically, this is the idea. So you can get these blocks that are basically sequential reading, these two, or could be this uh, neighborhood reading. But the idea is the same. So the, for the training, they use a bit more than one million blocks. For testing, 250,000 blocks, of course, the random division. And the parameters were tuned only on the textual features. And as I said, it's a, a perceptron, so one hidden layer and 10 training iterations. And here, just will tell you, that, just if you're cu curious, what were the features. So features are the standard, are standard things in, in text search, so things like DF, IDF, over the tags, the title, the description, everything, cosine similarity, maximum TF-IDF score, average TF-IDF score, 
and so on. The scores are normalized by column and by row. And then visual features. These should be very simple features because you don't want to spend too much time uh, analyzing images. So we use things like color histogram, color layout, a scalable color, two coming from edges, and one coming from texture. And these are standard things in, in image, content image search. And these should be things that are lightweight, they take less, little space, and they can be computed fast. And we're using, as if you saw the previous uh, architecture, we're using Hadoop to compute all this fast. So the classification, two classes, clicked and non-clicked, so you want to predict things that would be clicked or not. Uh, you train on patterns independently. Uh, you average we the weight vector of all models uh, uh, posted during training. This is, sorry, there's a mistake there. And we will use the score of the machine learning algorithm to rank the images in each block. So basically, you are trying to predict the ranking in each block, and that will be helpful to predict which one will be clicked in each block. So these are the results. And the results are, are quite encouraging. So the retrieval baseline is the standard search algorithm using tax, the one that we were using. And then learning baseline is just to learn the tag ranking. So this is not better than what we had before, because that's an optimized algorithm. But then if you use textual features, visual features, and you combine the features, you improve each time the result. Uh, this is. Uh, not new, but here is another confirmation that the uh, evidence of relevance that you get from images is quite different of the evidence of relevance that you get from text. So in this case, tags give you different relevant information than the image itself. So they are good com complement. You gain using both. And you see the, this more than almost 20% improvement in the last uh, two rows. Okay, questions, no? Okay. This is the second example, basically there are three examples of what we are doing. And I think I said almost uh, everything already. So visual features improve results over the baseline, the combination of text and visual features is much better. And this one thing is not clear here, but at the end, after doing this, we found that the block construction really doesn't mirror human gaze when you put the ranking on top of that. So still, uh, there's room for improvement because maybe the way to use the clicks is not in blocks, it's something different. So it's not like in web search and it's not in blocks. And we have to do more work on that. But very important, the clicks work. So uh, corollary, some people think. It's very important. It's not a joke, don't worry. What to measure? You are the experts. So here's a list of things. In web search, we use mainly DCG and NDCG. And one question here important is, what happens when you have a tie? And I will not talk about this problem, but I think this is a very important problem. So you have two results where you have a tie on the measure, and you see them, and your intuition will tell you right away this is better than the other. How you put that into the measure? And the problem when you're looking at top 10 results of top 20 results, you will have many times. It's not true if you are, say, computing this over 1,000 answers. But when you are computing this over a few answers, you will have times. So this is a question for you. Second question, how good are these measures for the users? Do really reflect what the users are looking when they search or what they are doing? And we don't have an answer for that. So we, we, we cross our fingers thinking that DCG will do it. And, and if we have problems, we can talk to Carl, right? Again, individual queries or sessions. And, and it's good to see a session evaluation track in track. And the last one is the one that I don't have an answer. Why we're obsessed with the average? So, and I will tell you why I don't, we don't like the average. 
although we use the average because that's the standard. So first, balance is also important in web search. So don't, you don't want to be good and then surprise the user for one single query. Also, if you're improving the answers in the popular queries that are well answered, that's irrelevant for us. We want to improve, say, in the long tail. So the average doesn't capture that. And also, large improvements might be better because they're giving new insight in something. So suppose we have 5% uh, of the queries where we do 50% better. Well, that's interesting, how we can highlight that, how we can give more weight to that. And just to show you the, the intuition, and I did this in an airport, so it's not the best. Because I was trying to think how, how you can give the intuition. So let's say we can measure quality, whatever it is. OK? Relevance from editors, so it should be a weighted relevance, and so on. And you have certain queries. And suppose you have two search engines, one and two. Let's say that you compute the quality and you get this. So blue is always better than red, except for one query. And of course, if you compute the average, it's done, this example just done, such that the average of the blue is better than the red. So what is better for the search engine? I didn't notice we have 11 results, not 10. I didn't count this. Okay, leave you with the question. So if that result is really bad, the blue one, maybe I would prefer to be the red. Always consistent, always certain level of results. Even more, if we can say there's a threshold, this is very important with search, where we can say, okay, any query above this green line is, the answer is okay. Any query below this green line is not well answered. And those are the queries that we have to focus on. 